this may not be a traditional opening, but I still feel like I have to share this with you all before I can rightfully begin. Hopefully it'll give you all some context to our situations. A few years have passed since my experiences in the Peace Corps in 2012. A few nights ago I woke up at 4 in the morning. I want to say it was the sound of someone making noise in my apartment complex, but I'm pretty sure it was a recollection. I rolled over as quietly as I could and pawed the area around my bed for a few seconds in a motion I had repeated far too often after my service. With each moment of groping that passed, I grew more frantic, but in the haze of my waking state, I couldn't understand why. It wasn't until I felt the handle that I understood why I was so upset. I couldn't feel the machete that I kept by my bedside until that moment. It's become a mechanical function for me these past five years. Roll over, touch your machete, assure yourself that you're all right, that you're safe. That little action has been so ingrained into my nightly habits that I didn't even realize when I'm doing it or why. Good or bad, it's a part of me. I'll likely keep doing this for years to come. Please just keep that in mind while you read these recollections. These stories have all impacted us in some way, are influencing our current decisions, and I can only hope that they'll provide an understanding for all of you by reading them. There's one last thing I want to clear up before we get into the flesh of the story. I visited each friend from the Peace Corps personally and asked them if they would be all right with me sharing what's happened to them on this website. They are all great people. They told me that that would be fine with that as long as I kept their identities secret. I can say that if the tables were turned, I likely wouldn't be able to do the same with such confidence. They are better than me in this aspect. These people willingly told me their horrifying experiences to share with you all because they want you to understand what it's like to be in the Peace Corps, to work in a foreign country where the nearest hospital can be a day's, day's trip away. I hope you will. Let me start this all with a bit of a disclaimer. This was in no way written to discourage people from enlisting in the Peace Corps. I spent two and a half years in Nicaragua and those experiences, while trying at times, were some of the best memories of my life. These stories are being written out to help people realize what it was like to live in another culture, environment, and the inherent horrors and joys that that entails. These are just a few of the stories that could be told. One had been in La Quinta, my site, for about a year. I was used to living in that small community of 600 people. Everyone knew my name or at least one of my many nicknames. For the sake of brevity, I will only list three of my nicknames. Gringo Lobo, L. Pikefler, and Travis Cumba. I will leave it up to your imagination as to why I was named the Wolf Gringo or the Hummingbird. As for Travis Cumba, it was their attempt to pronounce my surname, which they had difficulties with. Fun fact, a Cumba is a type of machete with a hook tip that is used for cutting wood. For a few months, some people literally assume my full name was basically Travis Machete. I believe I will never have another nickname that badass ever again in my life. My average day consisted of waking up early and visiting the houses in my community. I would visit 10 to 15 houses to pitch my projects, see if there was anything I could do to help or just to talk. 
in the afternoon when the Gaias would return from their crops that they had planted up in the mountains. We would do a variety of work ranging from vaccinating chickens, building ovens, or castrating pigs. I enjoy my schedule and the work I did. The sun set at about seven or eight o'clock and everyone would go to bed. I do not mean that everyone would return to their house. I mean that everyone would be in bed and asleep by about 8 p.m. I could never really get into that sleeping schedule, so I would have three or four hours to myself until I was able to drift off. I typically spent this time reading, writing, or reclining in my hammock. One night I was resting in my hammock while reading a short story by Harlan Ellison's A Boy and His Dog. I was smoking a Belmont Suave. I have mentioned this before, but every drag from a Belmont Suave cigarette felt like you were punching yourself in the lungs. The evangelical part of my community was not a fan of people smoking cigarettes so I kept some of my vices under wraps for as long as I could so I would be viewed in a positive light and could continue my work with them. It was midway through my cigarette that I looked over and saw someone watching me through the wall. To elaborate on this situation, little, my house consisted of dirt floors with bricks up to about shoulder level. At this point, my Nicaraguan grandmother had run out of money and used wooden boards to bridge the gap up to the tin roof. This setup worked in a pinch, but it had the drawback of leaving two-inch gaps between each piece of wood. The lack of privacy didn't really bother me all that much until this moment, when I noticed that someone was looking at me through the slats in my wall. I figured the person was just looking into my room to see if I was awake or not before knocking as it was about nine o'clock. I decided to not let on that I had spotted them to try and save ourselves the awkwardness of having caught me into awkward situations. I was smoking and since I wasn't wearing a shirt, my tattoo was visible. I would leave it up to them whether they wanted to knock on my door and confront me, or if they wanted to save themselves the embarrassment and walk away. I continued to read and occasionally take a drag from my cheap and crappy Belmont Suave. About 15 minutes later, I had finished a section of the story and my horrible cigarette. I turned in my hammock and snuffed the cigarette out on the dirt floor. While doing that, I took a peek at the gap in my wall. The eye was still regarding me through the crack. At this point, I was more frustrated than anything else. Their persistent invasion of my privacy had finally made me confrontational. I swung on the hammock and set my book down on the wooden board I used as a shelf and threw on a shirt. I opened up my door and stepped outside. I walked around the outer wall of my room, but I turned up nothing. The person was gone. I visited the latrine and then returned to my room. I finished up my book and went to bed around 11 o'clock. While that may not seem like a late hour, let me point out that most people had been asleep for about three hours now. In their opinion, I was a regular night owl. Later, when they found out about my smoking and tattoo, I was also labeled a rebel and a gangster, which now seems ridiculous in retrospect. As you can tell from the photo, my bed wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world. I would get a few hours of sleep every night before I would toss and turn and try to find a more comfortable position. I woke up at around three that night and rolled over in my bed. In doing so, I found myself looking directly at the eye that had been watching me earlier at night through the gaps of my wall. 
I maintained eye contact with that person for a good couple of minutes. I don't know how long I stared and I don't know how long they had been watching me. I became painfully aware that the locking mechanism for my door was a small piece of metal that I slid into a catch which consisted of two intersecting nails. I was glad I slept with a cumba by my bed, the necessity for which will be evident in the third story. Eventually they left and I went back to sleep. To this day I have no clue who it was that was watching me through the slats in my wall. To me, that was the most frightening part of the whole experience. It has even inspired some of my earlier stories. Not the invasion of privacy when I was at my most unguarded moment, but that this person eyed me in my hammock for at least 15 minutes and then watched me sleep for an unknown period of time. I lived with these people for another year after that experience. It could have been anyone, a man I built an oven or vaccinated chickens with, a woman I gossiped with or who taught me how to cook. I have no clue. I lived in La Quinta for two years with a person who was so focused on me that they once watched me sleep.